been recorded. Uh, Melody and Fatima, thank you to you for moderating this meeting. They're volunteers in San Diego. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of the order of this session, I just want to go through the agenda. And basically, you are, I'm going to introduce each, each speaker and then they're going to be sharing their stories. At around 8.35, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and direct them to individuals who are speaking. If you have questions, you can post them in the chat. And those questions, we won't be able to answer them all, but we'll do our best to answer them. If you just make a point, as, as you're hearing us, to type in your questions, Melody and Fatima will be making a note of them and make a point of who it is directed to, and we will ensure that speaker receives that question. But please wait for the question until we're in question time. So, I know people are joining still. So let me welcome you again to this discussion in which we're standing against harmful practices together. I made the point that in the United States, you can legally marry under the age of 18 in some states as young as 13 years old. In the UK, it is permissible to marry with parental consent at the age of 16 years old, but we know that in this space of child marriage, that consent can be coerced, and you're going to hear about that too. Also, just to be mindful that we are going to be talking very openly and honestly. The speakers are going to be sharing their personal experiences. This may trigger some people, so please be mindful in terms of taking care of yourself. I'm going to start by introducing Dawn. So Dawn is my very first speaker. Dawn regards herself to be an activist, an author, a speaker, and her goal is to serve supporting many. That's rooted in her own personal experience of being a child bride at the age of 13 years old in which she was forced to marry a 32-year-old man, she puts it, authorised by her father's signature. So Dawn, please share with the audience your experience in your own words. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for providing this safe space for us to share our stories. And um, I'm just so thankful for the work that each of you are doing. It inspires me to keep using my voice every day. And I believe that we're blazing the way for those to come. My name is Don Tyree and I was forced into marriage at 13 years old to a 32 year old man. He had been sexually abusing me for two years. But before I go into that, I wanna back up just a little bit and talk about the abuse that I believe set me up for sexual abuse time and time again. From my memory, the first sexual predator entered my life when I was eight years old. And the message that I received at that time was that I had to give up something special just to exist in this world. And then there was another abuser and another abuser and then the man that I married. Excuse me. My father had remarried and my dad and my new stepmother decided to move 1400 miles away and start a new life and business together. And they left me behind in California. They moved to Texas. And this man was a family friend of my stepmother's and she felt that it was okay to have him move into our family home and kind of be my primary care provider, my nanny, if you will. And as I look back now, I can see how each day, like, he made it known that, you know, he, he cared for me, he loved me, he was providing for me. And if my parents, in fact, really cared about me, they wouldn't have left me behind and they would have been there for me. And so my, the relationship dyna dynamic was interesting in that I really did care for him as well. Like he was the trusted adult in my life. And so once again, I knew that I had to give up this thing just to exist in the world. Um, excuse me. So during the two years that we were in that house alone together, um, I became more and more isolated from my friends in the neighborhood, from even family that was local. Um, I became his property. He controlled 
what I did, when I did it, and even whether or not I went to school. I missed a lot of school during those years and not one teacher or principal checked up on me and they knew that my parents were 1400 miles away. After two years, I became pregnant and he decided to step forward and have a conversation with my parents and let them know that he was in fact the father of the child. I don't remember a lot of fighting or like screaming and yelling or anything like that when all of this was revealed. Um, what I remember most was the rejection from my stepmother. Like she shamed me about it. She victim blamed me. She told me that I caused it, that I created this mess, that I was seeking attention. Um, and so that's kind of what happened as the pregnancy unfolded. Um, and the drama went on for about two weeks. But a few days after she learned that I was pregnant, she, she tried to terminate the pregnancy at home. Um, it was a failed attempt and I'm very thankful to be here as well as my oldest child, my son. I think what happened during those two weeks, um, when I look back now with the perspective that I have now and the education that I have now, I can see that my stepmother was triaging a situation where she, they were trying to save each other. There were three adults involved here. There was my rapist and my parents. And so by agreeing to the marriage, they were saving him from charges like statutory rapes, child sex abuse, and a prison sentence. The marriage saved him from that. The marriage also saved my parents from any kind of child neglect charges or child abuse charges or just child abandonment. I mean, they just, they packed up and left and left me behind with this man. So the marriage saved all the adults and put me in a prison to be a sex slave. I wanna reflect on what a marriage looks like between a 13 year old girl and a 32 year old man. I lost everything. I lost a sense of well being. I lost the rights to my own body. I lost my education. There's no equality in the marriage. There will never be an equality in a child marriage. The child doesn't agree to it. The child is forced into it. I was not beat to agree to the marriage. I was emotionally manipulated for two weeks until I finally, I can't say that I gave in. I was just silenced, completely silenced, no voice whatsoever. After my first firstborn, I was told that um, I couldn't get pregnant again if I was breastfeeding. Also backing up just a little bit, during the rapes before I became pregnant, I was told that I was too young to get pregnant. Yet this man that was raping me taught me how to douche every single time we had sex, just in case. So after my firstborn, I breastfed hoping to not get pregnant again. Because when you're in a child marriage, having more children is how, how they keep you trapped. Having more children is a dependence on this man. You can't get out. The more children you have, the, the more difficult it becomes to escape. So by 15 years old, I was pregnant for the second time with my daughter. It was after my daughter was born that I kind of had an emotional, intellectual, and pivotal shift in everything. Um, I didn't even want him to change her diaper. I was afraid that he would sexually abuse her even as an infant. And it wasn't just her. At that point, I was just, it was a time where I was really coming to terms with what was going on. And I felt like this is perfect for him. This pedophile has me, I'm having babies, and he gets to just sexually abuse us all. This is legal sex trafficking. So after my daughter was born, I began to plot my way out of that marriage. Getting out of 
any controlling, manipulative, abusive environment is difficult. And some don't make it. Some are killed by their perpetrators. Some girls commit suicide just to get out because that's the only way out. Let's consider this for a moment. I wanted to get out. I'm 15 years old. I want to run away. I have nowhere to go. My parents have made it really clear to never ever reach out to any family members. So if I leave, this man can pick up the phone, report me as a runaway, and when the police pick me up at my friend's house, they take me back to my rapist. That's the kind of control that they have. I decided to let my kids go live with his mom and dad. And I moved in with a family member. And I stayed there for a couple of months until I found a job and a roommate situation. And I went back to his parents to just visit my children. And I took them and we hid for as long as possible. And he always found us. We went to court time and time again. The custody battle went on for years. And in court, his argument was that I was not old enough to be a mother. I was not old enough to provide for them. I couldn't do it. I was just a child. Yet three years before that, I was old enough to get married, old enough to have sex, and old enough to give birth, old enough to be a wife. But when I wanted to live independently with my children, suddenly I wasn't old enough. That's the message. It's crazy. The court denied my request to have supervised visitation. The judge would not hear my story that he had raped me. Not, not from 11 years old to 13 years old and not from 13 to 16. I was not heard. The court would not acknowledge that I was living in fear that he was gonna sexually abuse my children. I was told by the judge time and time again, you guys were in a union, you were married. There's nothing we can do about it. And so I picked up my children and we ran. We lived a life on the run for 10 years. I denied him visitation, I broke court orders and I fled the state of California. He caught up to us when my two children were a junior and, soft, or a junior and senior in high school. And at that point, I, didn't, I wasn't afraid anymore. My children had enough information to make an educated decision um, to determine what kind of relationship they wanted to have with him. They don't have a relationship with him to this day. I wanna talk about accountability. I wanna talk about the numerous adults in my life that could have prevented this. It's your neighbors. It was my neighbors, the ones that saw me with this man every single day. The ones that saw my parents load up a truck and move 1,400 miles away. Our friends, our family members. What about the judges that signed these licenses? One judge could have saved my life. I wanna talk about the clergy that didn't do anything about it. I was in a private school. They knew I was living alone with this man. I was miserable. I looked awful. I don't know if any of you have seen my, my childhood pictures. I look miserable. I was hurting. My academics sucked. Somebody could have reached out to me and asked me, what's going on at home? Why did you miss five days of school? Legislation could have changed this. Legislation could have stopped this from happening. My call to action today is that we keep the momentum going. We are educating, people are listening, survivors are stepping up. Let's make a change. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you for your strength, your courage to share with us here today. And, um, we salute you and thank you for sharing this because I know deep down you give something of yourself every time you're sharing your story. 
what I wanted to sh ask you was, you did a very personal essay, I turned my childhood marriage trauma into activism. How, for the people hearing you, do you manage to turn such trauma around in terms of being this woman of strength today? How do you manage to let that go? I don't think I ever let it go. I mean, I've done a lot of work in myself and with myself and acknowledging what happened and honoring the pain, I think is the most important thing, at least for me, is honoring that. And then I'm able to just kind of bundle it up and, and hold it as a fire in the palm of my hands and, and keep going. I mean, it's my, that's my torch, if you will. That trauma is my torch to keep going. Yeah. And we pass it to each other. Yeah. So your motivation clearly is to reach out to as many people as possible. I, I hear that in your voice. Can I ask you also, so people have joined us, I've probably never heard of this issue. You know, we're, we're here to educate people also. Some of the key people you talked about that did not protect you were the people who were meant to love you the most. These were your family. So, you know, stepmother, father, not the people in authorities, I'm talking about family. Can you just explain that experience to us in terms of how do we, how do we understand how family members who are meant to protect you can do this to you? I'm going to try to answer that the best I can. I have a lot to say. Okay. <laughs> um, for me, and I think for a lot of people, we are raised in a culture to mind our own business, even if it is direct family members, even if it is your cousin or, um, you know, a, a, a sibling, a half sibling, a step brother or sister. I mean, the bottom line is that we're, we're raised to respect other people's privacy and other people's choices. And so it's conflicting when you see, or, you know, suppose you hear the neighbor that's screaming at their child and you actually don't know whether or not they're, physically abusing the child you just hear a lot of screaming and crying and so you're like do I get involved do I disrupt this you know other family unit where you know you're worried that if you make that phone call to child protective services or you make that phone call to the police you're going to disrupt a, an entire family unit and you could save a life so that third party reporting is really important, even if from the outside looking in, it's the family. In this it's space. critical. Yeah. It's absolutely critical. I mean, we're called to do that. These, that is mandatory reporting. Sure. Okay, thank you, Dawn. Um, just thank to you. say, people can tweet. Dawn's contact details are going to be on the presentation, but the Twitter handle is at Dawn and it's D-A-W-N-B-T-Y-R-E-E. -E. That's, That's right. right. So if people want to tweet, please do. And you'll have the opportunity to ask Dawn more questions during the question time. Thank you, Dawn, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person I'm going to introduce you to is Paisy. And Paisy Mahmood is from the UK. And Paisy is herself a survivor of child marriage. She was also forced alongside her sister to have FGM, female genital mutilation. And Paisy is somebody who's an outstanding speaker here in the UK and internationally, and she is going to share with you her personal experience, which also includes the tragic death of her sister, Benaz Mahmoud. So Paisy, we we'll welcome you. Please take the platform to share your story. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jaspinda. Good evening, everyone. I just want to start by saying thank you so much to Davinda for having me speak at this event and solidarity to all the speakers who are trusting us with their story today. I was coerced into marriage at the age of 16 to a man who was 30, and this is just a fraction of my child marriage story. On a cold April night, I laid in my bed desperately trying not to fall asleep. I was scared to sleep even though I had college the next day and I had to be up early. I felt as though my chest was on fire and every breath that he took, I felt more and more scared. 
as I laid there that night, I kept thinking about my escape route. And the only thing that I could think of was jumping out of the window, even though I was on the first floor. You're probably wondering why was I thinking these things that night? It was because I was laying next to my husband who had just tried to have intercourse with me. And when I'd refused because I was shattered, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally, my husband couldn't understand and he instead threatened me. And his exact words to me were, if I wanted to kill you right here in your sleep, I could do that just like they did to your sister, except I would make sure that the police would never find you. My sister's body had just been found because she'd been murdered for leaving her abusive child marriage and falling in love with somebody. My life wasn't my life. I felt like I was in a movie and I had no say in anything that happened. I was 17 years old, married and living in London while desperately trying to be a normal teenager, just like the rest of my friends were. I cherished my three days at college because that was my only escape from the life that I was living, which seemed like a daily nightmare. I'd been married for a year and a half, and this was no love marriage. This wasn't two people meeting and falling in love head over heels. It was quite the opposite. I didn't want to, meet, I didn't want to marry my husband. I was told to marry him. I had no choice in it. My father decided that it was time for me to marry and he decided who I married. I hated my husband from the moment that I met him. I hated him with every inch of my being because not only did he behave like a second father to me, what he wanted from me was more like a slave. He wanted a wife that would cook for him, that would clean for him, start a family and just give up on her life. And he would smile in the presence of company so narcissistically and he would talk about what a great modern husband he was and how suitable we were for one another. But behind closed doors, what no one saw was that he was a monster. And my plans for my future, just like any 16, 17 year old, were that my future would be fun and adventurous and I would study and finish my education. I would get a degree and I would travel with my sisters and with my friends and I would see on TV hiking trips and picnics and that's all I dreamed of seeing other cities and other countries. And that one day if I were to marry I would fall in love and I would meet somebody who loved me and everything about me and I would do the same and that I would choose my wedding dress just like every girl dreams of. But who was I kidding? All of these dreams that I had were never going to happen. They were never going to happen because of the family setting that I grew up. My life was planned for me, every decision, every key moment and my voice from a very young age was muted. I grew up in Iran for the first 11 years of my life and then my family immigrated to London in the late 90s where four of my sisters, my brother and my parents settled. London coming from Iran was an absolute dream for me. I had never seen anything like it. It was so vibrant, it was so beautiful and it was a multicultural city full of life and opportunities. But it wasn't that for me or my sisters. What my parents had planned for us was a very traditional, close-knit and sheltered life where we were not able to mix with anybody outside of school, outside of school hours, and we were not able to engage in modern activities as they called it. And we certainly weren't allowed to dress like English girls or express ourselves like English girls or do anything they did, such as listen to music or wear makeup or anything like that. So marrying when they wanted us to marry was part of the rules that we had to adhere to. And as a gal, I was taught, especially as a gal, that I must be protected from the outside world, which is why me and my sisters had to undergo FGM. I was always told how to behave. I was always reminded how a good girl behaves and how quiet girls are and how girls sit and how girls play. And I learned, I'm sad to say from a really young age that my life wasn't my life 
and my body and my future, none of these were mine. They were to be controlled by a man, whether it was my father, a husband, a brother, or even a male cousin or a male member of the community. As long as there was somebody around that was male, I had no say in my life. So when my father told me about marriage, the first time he spoke to me about it, I knew there and then I couldn't say no. And as a child, you want to believe that your parents will love you, they will protect you from any harm. You never imagine in your wildest dreams that they would directly expose you to the worst harm you could experience. My parents exposed me to harm and abandoned me when I probably needed them the most, when I was young and I needed guidance, guidance on how to have a happy and a healthy future. The moment that it was decided that I was to marry this man who I'd met only once and I was told not to speak to him and not to look at him, that's the moment I feel like my inner child went into autopilot mode and the less I felt, the better. It was too painful to allow myself to even live in the present. I feel as though I just died inside and tried to just continue barely surviving, not living. I remember seeing my husband for the first time and I felt so much rage. Why would you want to marry me? I'm just a child. And he was a grown man. I was a 16 year old with a motor mouth. I'm going to admit, I never stopped talking. You could always hear me. I would laze around in my pajamas and watch cartoons all day on the weekends with my sisters. Why did this man want to marry me? I was a child. We had nothing in common. To this day, it makes me feel sick thinking about the fact that he chose a child to marry. And he knew it was wrong. My parents knew it was wrong yet they were all complicit in this happening. I remember so vividly walking into an abortion clinic just three months after I was married. I remember picking up a magazine, a hello magazine, and the thing that I felt excited about was that I was reading a article about a footballer's wife. And all I could think about was that I would relay that story to my friends later at college. I didn't know what an abortion was, and I didn't know what I was about to experience. I feel a very deep sadness when I say this today, that back then I was three months pregnant, but I did not know how I'd gone pregnant because I had no access to sex education. And even though I was throwing up every morning, I couldn't fit in my clothes and my body was changing. I didn't know that I was pregnant. And none of the adults around me noticed anything wrong or ever even supported me in just asking, are you okay? My family and my husband encouraged me to have a baby, but I knew that I hated everything and anything to do with my husband. I don't know now to this day what it was inside of me that fought that said no, but I'm so deeply grateful for going ahead and fighting against everything that everyone told me and having an abortion arranged. I didn't have anybody. I solely relied on myself. I was the only person who had my back. I was the only person who would look out for me. And I would spend days on end taking the bus to college, just daydreaming, daydreaming about being somebody else. That would be the only thing that would comfort me, pretending that I was somebody else and that I had a different life. What I began to do was to automatically go into different characters as a coping mechanism. And I started to pretend to be asleep when he would get home from work. I would lie every day and say that I was sick just to get out of spending time with him. I would take up extra courses at college. I would stay and just sit in the library and read. And I would travel to my parents' home every day for an hour, on, on the way and an hour back, just so that I could limit the time I spent with him. I was so desperate to get away from my husband. And although my parents' home was an escape from him, it was not an escape from that familiar feeling of existing without a voice. Because for the time I was married, I would plead with my parents again and again to please support me in divorcing. I would cry to them weekly. But my parents would send me back to him 
And they would say to me that I would need to do better. I would need to do better at being a wife. And this was happening to both me and my sister. My sister Benaz was 17 when she had a child marriage. And just like mine, her husband was abusive. And when she suffered his abuse for two years and finally decided that she would leave him, my sister would go to the police and she would report the abuse and nothing would happen for her. No support system would ever be provided. And although the least safer space my sister could go to was my parents, when she left her husband, she had no other choice but to go back to my parents' home. Within six months of my sister going back to that home, men in my family and community decided that it was her actions, not her abusive ex-husband, but it was her actions that had brought shame onto our family name. And in a bittersweet twist, after my sister's death, I managed to divorce my husband. I walked up and down high streets for weeks, desperately begging solicitors to help me file a divorce even though I had no idea what things now for other girls, because I know that you are campaigning in the UK. If you can just tell us briefly about that campaign. Of course. Um, so what I'm campaigning for are the laws in the UK to be changed. In my case, I was 16 and my parents decided when I can marry. I think that's absolutely wrong. A girl should be able to decide when she wants to marry. And 16 to 18 is such a pivotal time for children to grow and pursue their dreams. And not to be wives, not to be somebody's wife cooking and cleaning for an abuser. They shouldn't be in that position. They should be focusing on their education the same way that our government has realized and has told us that children must stay in education until 18. And so the marriage laws need to mirror that. We need to allow children to pursue their dreams and not be victims of this type of abuse. So I have a petition which has a great amount of support and I think it will be linked in this. So I would appreciate it if everyone could support me in signing that petition. Thank you. Thank you, Paisy. And I encourage you all to sign that petition because in the UK, you can get married at the age of 16 with parental consent, but we all understand how that consent can be coerced, as in your case, as in the cases of many. So it needs to be 18. Thank you, Paisy. And there'll be an opportunity. Please, people, keep your questions going. If they're for Paisy or Dawn, put them up there and we can ask you on the question time. We will keep going. Well, whoever wants to come in and start to try and intimidate us, we will not be intimidated. Davinda, I would like to now introduce you. And Davinda actually is the person who has kindly hosted this and it was her idea. So credit to you, Davinda. If I may, by brief introduction, introduce you. Davinda was born and raised in Bradford, here in England. She was 14 years old when she was shown the picture of the man she would have to marry at the age of 18. Davinda was forced into that marriage, but after six weeks, she did manage to escape. Now she tells her story also, as with many of the survivors here, to raise awareness and for legislative change too. So Davinda, may I introduce, I've introduced you. Can you please join us and take the platform and share your story? Thank you. Thank you, Jess, Davinda. I first of all, just want to thank everyone for being here and especially these incredible speakers that I'm sharing the platform with. I'm honored to have you uh, on this platform with me. And yeah, we will not be silenced. And Paisley, I'm so sorry for the interruptions during your speaking. You're incredibly brave. All of us must carry on this struggle no matter what, nobody can silence us. So I will uh, begin my story. My story started uh, back in England. So as a teenager, I used to love reading romance novels. Getting into bed close to midnight after a full day of school, chores, and homework, I would escape into another world. I dreamt of a hero, tall, dark, and handsome, mysterious and aristocratic, sweeping me off my feet to live happily ever after. The reality was quite different. My siblings and I were raised by parents who had moved to England in their childhood and had recreated an oppressive Orthodox Punjabi household in the city of Bradford. We were to be decorative, quietly doing our chores, staying in the background. Our thoughts, our hopes, our wishes were unimportant. We were not allowed to date as our marriages were to be arranged. We had no choice 
we had no voice. One day, the big and turbaned Sikh man came to visit. He and my mom talked softly, looking over at me occasionally. After he left, my mom came over and showed me a photograph of a boy and said, he's a nice boy. You're very lucky to get a chance to marry this kind of a boy. He's good looking and very well educated. What do you think? Do you say yes? If I'd answered no, she would have slapped me. Who do you think you are? Your friend got her wedding arranged. She didn't object to marrying the boy from India. What's so special about you? What makes you so different? I was 14 years old. Within a few days or weeks, the boy's Tinder was in Bradford and a meeting had been set up. I was told I could only say hello to him and to sit next to him quietly. This stranger put his arm around my shoulders. When we posed for pictures with his family, I didn't realize the significance of the proceedings, but apparently that was my engagement party. Satinda was just an average looking boy, not at all like my mom had described him. They were all happy, but I had no voice. What happened to the romances I'd read about in the books? I was not allowed to have the same dreams and aspirations as those characters. We went on a holiday that following summer of 1984 for six weeks to the Punjab, India, where we stayed with our relatives. We visited Satinda's village and there was a big party. We met his parents and the rest of his family. Again, I got to say hello, post the pictures and had to be polite. I realized that this was another engagement party and I was a 15 year old guest of honor. This trip to India was to buy clothes and jewelry for my wedding. I thought this was a holiday, but really it was a business trip, the business of engagement and arranged marriage. Life went on for the next two years. I was 17. I had applied and been accepted into a college in Leeds, but my mom forbade me to attend, reminding me that as I was getting married soon, there's no need for further education. He's been waiting to marry you since you were 14. You have to make an effort and call him or write to him, poor boy. So I enrolled in a government work training program where they taught secretarial skills and then gave us job placements. I, I knew that, you know, towards the end of a training program that I had to run away as soon as I could, as soon as I turned 18. I felt guilty at the thought of hurting my family, but I knew I had to do it. One day, soon after I turned 18, I took a taxi from near our shop, bought a one-way ticket on a bus to London and escaped. I'd never been to London. I didn't know anyone there and especially didn't know where I was going to stay. During the entire five hour ride to London, I was petrified that by now they had discovered I was gone and might be following me. I had about 5,000 pound savings from making the smosas and from the job placements. I stayed in a cheap bed and breakfast in central London until I found a small room in a house as a paying guest. The next few weeks went by in trying to settle in, find odd jobs and get my bearings. I was homesick sometimes and one day I decided to call my family to let them know I was okay. My mom said, your grandma's really ill. She's not doing that well. We've been so worried. Please come home. As I was very fond of my grandma, I decided to go home for a visit to see her. I know what you're thinking. Big mistake. And yes, it was. My grandma was just fine. I recognized it for what it was, a trick and deception. My grandma was just fine. The pressure and guilt were put on me to marry Satinda. How are we gonna tell everyone you don't wanna get married to him? He's been waiting all this time. His brother and sister-in-law think of you like a sister and love you. You can't do this to them was the justification. It was all a blur, but I felt defeated. I was sent to Denmark to stay with the matchmaker's family. My family joined me after a few weeks for the wedding with someone I had no common ground with, not even language. I didn't speak fluent Punjabi and he didn't speak any English. My mother was elated, of course. No one seemed to notice my misery as they were all celebrating. I blocked out the wedding night and the sham honeymoon to Venice and Rome. I was very unhappy and told Satinda upon our return to Copenhagen that I didn't want to continue to be intimate with him and slept on the sofa. He was disappointed, but somehow agreed. When my dad came for a visit, 
I conveyed my unhappiness and unwillingness to continue the marriage. He suggested that we just need more time together. Then he and my husband went out to a bar to drink. Soon, my husband returned home, alone and drunk. He said he was mad at being denied his rights as my husband for so long. He told me I was bad and that he, if he couldn't have me, no one else could either. He then told me he had every right to sleep with me and that I was going to succumb to whatever he wanted. He started strangling me and slapping me hard. And I knew instinctively that if I did not give in to his demands, he could hurt me more. I apologized for hurting his feelings and told him I would do whatever he wanted that would not leave him and I had made a mistake. He relaxed his hold on my neck, but proceeded to force me to give in to him and to serve his sexual desires. Through the whole violent act, he said I had to start listening to him, act more like a wife and try harder in our marriage. I was crying and assured him I would, begging his forgiveness. He was rough and still angry with me and I was petrified his violence would escalate. I was shocked, violated and frightened. This monster had just raped me by use of terror and violence. I told my dad when he returned from the bar that my husband had just raped me, that he had strangled me and was going to kill me if I didn't give in to his demands. I don't want anything to do with him, dad. He only said, he's your husband. He has every right to do that to you. My dad didn't want to help his own daughter who was pleading for his help. I was being controlled, abused, terrified by bullies. I had to get away from them, from my evil husband and from the dad who refused to protect his daughter. On the pretext of making tea for them, I thought this was my chance. Now, while I was out of their line of sight, I grabbed my bag, walked softly and opened the door quietly and ran down the hundred steps to the street and to freedom. Again, for the second time in my life, I was running away. Again, I experienced the same fear as I took a taxi to a friend's house. I wondered if my dad and my husband had discovered that I was gone. I filed a police report of the rape and abuse. A few days later, I went to the apartment accompanied by colleagues to retrieve my belongings. Satinda was gone, but he had destroyed the apartment and taken my gold jewelry and personal possessions. A year later, my divorce to Satinda was final. There's a very fine line between arranged marriages and forced marriages. How can any 14 year old know what she really wants? She should be able to enjoy her life as a child. How could she say yes to marriage? She should have freedom in life to marry who she wants or decide if she even wants to get married. My heart aches for my 14 year old self. I wish I could help her now and tell her to be strong and say no. I was robbed of my childhood as I wasn't allowed to play outside with my friends, go to movies or hang out in the town center with them. Instead, I was trained to be domesticated starting at age seven for a life of serving a husband and his family. I count myself lucky having escaped from that bondage. I am speaking up against these atrocities practiced even today here in America, in the UK and certainly in India. Now, I have a voice. Thank you, Davinda, for that extremely powerful testimony. Um, you know, I'm just echoing in my mind in terms of um, Paisy made the point. She said, my life, my body, my future were not mine. It was all there to be taken and controlled by men. You know, and again, turning to family and how when you turn to family, your rights are totally disregarded and you're not protected by your family. Tell, tell me in terms of the relationship with your mother today, if you, if you don't mind, what is that relationship like with your mother today? Knowing that these were significant people in your life that actually took you to that space where they knew you would be harmed. Uh, yes, Jessica. So unfortunately, right now my relationship with my mom is uh, non-existent. Yeah, for the second time in my life, she's disowned me yet again. The first time was right after the marriage took place when I was 18. When I left him after six weeks, she disowned me. And I think it was about two years before I actually talked to my mom again. She let me back into her life, back into the family. And since then, I've kind of had, you know, the relationship with my family, but I was still told not 
I, you know, conditioned not to talk about it, not to bring up anything. I think she was very disappointed, obviously, in my choices. I was blamed for, you know, other things that happened in my family. Um, I was like, basically the person who destroyed the family name and leading a bad example. But anyway, I had a relationship with my family until just recently, um, just as recent as last year, I started speaking out and my mom found out. And now, yes, yeah, since last September, uh, she's just not talking at all again to me. So um, it's just kind of ironic to me that all these years later, I'm going through the very same thing that I went through when I was 18. So actually in this space, there's a cost to speaking out, albeit I know your family disowned you and we don't understand what that means in terms of the rejection and they're not acknowledging you. And even I would go as far as to say, seeing you as the perpetrator, you know, you're the person that has done this to the family. So there is a cost to speaking out. Yes. So we, we, we hear about murders in the name of so-called honor, you know, labeled honor killings, and we know they are the most dishonorable of killings. And Paisy just shared the experience of Benaz, her sister. But we know honor killings are an international issue. So tell us about any cases that have really stood out for you in the United States. Yeah, so um, there's, there's been like so many um, cases of honor killings. Um, so there's, for instance, there's Sarah and Amina Saeed. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. They were murdered by their dad, Yeza Abdel Saeed. Um, so he's wanted for the murder of his two daughters. They're from Irving, Texas. And, you know, basically what was their crime? Just refusing to adhere to the standards of the traditional Egyptian cultural behavior. So in 2008, he lured them into his taxi cab on the pretense of taking them out to eat and he fatally shot them in the cab. And he, so now he's listed as a fugitive on the FBI 10 most wanted fugitives list. So that's one here in Texas, um, two girls. And then the other one was Nur Fale Al-Maliki, uh, who's an Iraqi American. She died as a result of a collision from an automobile. And it was her dad um, in Peoria, Arizona in 2009, he cruelly knocked her over, causing her brain to bleed, and she later succumbed to a coma and then eventually death. And what had she done? She had a boyfriend, and this conflicted with her parents' um, wishes for her and also just her lifestyle and dress. That was her only so-called crime. And then we have Jaswinder Kaur Sidhu, who's an Indian-Canadian who was murdered in an honor killing she was kidnapped, tortured, and killed on the, mod on the orders of her mother, Malkit Korsidu, and her uncle, Surjit Singh Badisha, um, in, the in the Punjab, India. The orders had gone all the way from Canada to the Punjab to kill Jaswinda. What had she done? She said no to an arranged wedding, and she got married to someone of her choice. And then, um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the story of Shafilia Ahmed, mm -hmm. also from the UK. Actually, she was born in Bradford, the, the same city where I was born, uh, a 17-year-old British Pakistani who um, later on lived in Warrington, Cheshire. She was murdered by her parents in an honor killing in September 2003. And again, it was just due to her being too westernized. And her killing, um, her parents or her family actually just put plastic bag into her mouth and suffocated her to death. And she had written several poems that were very telling amongst one of the uh, writings that she did was a poem titled, I Feel Trapped. And this, yeah. this is just four cases and there's so many more. And I feel like if we don't tell our stories and this doesn't stop, the, you know, the child marriages, the forced marriages, there's stories I hear of every single day, other girls, even boys being killed by their families and it's got to stop. We've got to spread our awareness. So this is brought to the public attention. These honor killings have got to stop. Forced marriage, arranged marriage. And there, is this, marriage. and there is this common theme in terms of what Paisley described as growing up in Britain when you came here and having to live a life in almost the freedom of life is the only place you can be free is in school. 
And then as soon as you go home, the front door closes. It's a very different world where you have to adhere to rules and regulations where integration is seen as a threat to the reputation of the family. And in all those cases you describe, their crimes were asserting their independence, their rights, their freedom, and all those things. And just to say that July the 14th is now a national day of remembrance. It's the birthday of Shafilia Ahmed, and it's commemorated here in the UK, but also internationally by Carmen of Honor. And it's important that people join that to raise greater awareness also. So Devinda, thank you so much. Again, if people want to ask questions, please put them in the chat for Devinda and make sure you put her name next to it. Also to say, we're getting lots of messages coming through saying people, don't worry ladies, those interruptions just reinforce why we are speaking out. So I just wanted to point that out to you again and just reinforce, you know, the courage and thank you all for speaking. So thank you Devinda. I'm going to introduce the next speaker, who is Sara. Sara Tasneem is a forced marriage child survivor, and she's also a mentor and an activist. She works publicly to enact legislation that would legally ban child marriage in the United States. And I've looked at her story, and you know, in, in one quote, Tanzim, you say, Sara, you say that you've always been told that a woman's place was at home, and her job was to serve her husband and family. And again, you know, this is what we're hearing from many of the people here on this platform today. But also how strange it was to think that you grew up just thinking that this was somehow normal. So please share your story with us, Sarah. Yes, um, thank you so much for that um, introduction. And um, I also just want to take a moment to thank all of the survivors on this panel for just so fearlessly sharing your stories. I know how hard it is. And so um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and um, thank you to Vendor for organizing this. Um, so my name is Sara Tasneem. And as a 15 year old, I was forced to marry a man almost twice my age. He was 28 years old and he was 13 years older than me at the time. My father introduced me to my husband-to-be that morning, and I was told I would marry him that night. After a spiritual wedding ceremony that evening, performed by the leader of the group that my father belonged to, I was handed over to my new husband and left in his care. He became my guardian, my husband, and the father to my two children. That night, I lost my childhood, I lost my freedom, and I lost myself. I would never be the same person again. Six months after our spiritual ceremony, I was legally married at the age of 16 and pregnant. I was about seven months pregnant and my belly was like out to here. Um, I, was, um, <clears throat> I was in Reno, Nevada when we were legally married and none of it really felt like a real marriage to me. It felt more like I had been kidnapped and it felt like a prison. Instead of calling the cops on my, my husband, um, Reno, Nevada signed off on my marriage certificate and all it took was a signature from my father as one would sign a permission slip to excuse a child from school. My mom didn't even know where I was at the time. She actually thought that I was living with my father um, and just to back up a little bit so you have a little bit of context, um, my parents divorced when I was five years old. My mom was also forced to get married to my father when she was 19. I was born in Boulder, Colorado, and um, I came from a broken home. My, my mom left my dad when I was five, and um, he joined a very strict religious group and kept us from our mother most of our lives. So um, I really didn't grow up with a mother around. Um, she had come in and out of my life, um, but she was also a source of strength for me. Um, she had went on and uh, become a nurse. Um, she educated herself, she traveled the world, and she did come in and out of my life. Uh, my father told me growing up that my mom had left us because she didn't love us. Um, he was a very abusive father. Um, and often used religion as a cover for abuse. 
which I feel, you know, that is a similar thread that we have seen throughout many of these stories is that religion is often a cover for child abuse, for neglect, for, um, you know, marrying off children, um, for pedophilia, for so many things. Um, and that was an excuse that my father used for much of the abuse during my childhood. So um, I bounced around from house to house. I ended up living with my grandparents for a few years. And when I turned 12, I actually went to live with my mom. Um, she was living in, in Denver, Colorado at the time, and it was the first time I had reunited with her. And um, I started going to school, and I actually was experiencing, for the first time in my life, like a real childhood. I had friends, I was going to school, um, and I had all the things that I had wanted for so long in my childhood. Um, I had planned to join the Air Force and then go to law school. That was kind of my plan at 15 years old. And after my freshman year of high school, that's really what I wanted to do. Unbeknownst to me, my mother had reached out to my father and he had, um, you know, I think she had confided in him that I was seeing boys in my school and that she was going to put me on birth control. And, you know, she was, she basically confided in him, you know, what her plans were for my future. and. Her plans for my future was that I was going to live a free life. And um, at that time, I think that's when my father started planning my, my marriage, unbeknownst to me. He had asked my mom uh, to send me and my brothers to visit him in California and that we would return back afterwards and I would continue, you know, going to school and my regular life. So for me, I thought I was going on a summer vacation to visit my dad. I didn't want to go because I didn't. I still didn't want to be around my dad. He still scared me. Um, but, you know, I didn't have a choice. The parents in my life were the ones who controlled my life because I was a 15-year-old freshman in high school. Um, as soon as I stepped off that airplane, my father sat me down and told me that he was very disappointed in me and that I was going to go to hell unless I got married. Um, he said that the sheikh would find a suitable husband for me, and that was it. That was the end of the conversation. I thought nothing of it at the time. I thought maybe, um, you know, maybe he meant I was going to get engaged, or maybe he just meant, you know, um, I, I had no idea what he meant, but um, that summer we ended up going to a religious conference, and, and it was there that I was introduced to the husband, um, to my husband, and I was married to him that same evening. Um, after, after we spiritually were married, we left the country and came back to California where I was legally married. After having my, my daughter, um, things really changed for me. Um, I became extremely depressed and I really wanted to go back to school. Um, I would take my daughter for walks in the park and I would see kids my age, you know, going to school and I thought to myself, well, why can't it be like them? And why can't I, I go to school? So I started going back to school and I, um, I challenged everybody in my life at the time. Uh, it was in a very insular community at that time. It was, um, it was extremely difficult to challenge that community and they really turned their backs on me and they shunned me because I had decided to take the step of educating myself. Um, and as I started educating myself, I started realizing uh, more and more that I wanted freedom and I wanted freedom from him. I didn't want to be with him. And it was, it was a very slow process um, that I had come to a realization that, you know, uh, this marriage is not normal. Um, and at the end of the program that I was in, I ended up finding out that I was pregnant with my son. Um, and, and instead of it being a joyful time, I was devastated because I just knew I was going to be stuck with him for much longer. I still left him, and it was because of my education that I left him. Um, after graduating from a culinary program, I started uh, working, and I decided enough is enough, and I, um, I left him, and it took me about three years to legally divorce him. Um, and even as a 23-year-old, it was extremely difficult to navigate 
um, the complicated family law system that our, our country has. And I can't even imagine trying to leave him as a minor. And it, it would have been impossible because, I, first of all, I would not have been able to go to a shelter to get help. I would have not been able to call the police. They would have most likely returned me to my husband. I would have not been able to hire an attorney because I would have been under the age of 18. So these huge obstacles that children face don't stop when, when they enter into a marriage. And why should they have to face them? Why should have I had, why should any child have to face anything like this? Um, and I, you know, I'm here sharing my story because I think it's so important that we shed light on this dark, dark, dark subject. And I know it's hard to hear all of these stories and it's hard to hear the, the pain and the hurt, but there is a lot of work being done. And um, I just wanna thank all of the organizations out there that are creating room for our voices to come out and talk about this and creating the policy changes that will protect children. Um, Frady um, from Unchained at Last is here. She's gonna share with, with um, everybody her story and um, all the work that she's doing. Uh, but I, I just want to thank you all for, for listening and for allowing me to share my story today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for that really moving account. And um, I read, um, even at 15 years old, you had the vision of wanting to join the Reserve Officers Training Corps and yes. to apply to the US Air Force Academy and ultimately go to law school. Um, tell me, how has education enabled you on that road and that journey to freedom? Right, um, well education was the first thing that I had started fighting for as a child. And it was, it was the one thing that I really feel helped me get out of um, this farce of a marriage that I was forced into um, and that I never had felt was a real marriage. Um, but it was the one thing that empowered me, um, that enabled me to gain financial independence because while I was married, I was controlled financially. I, I was controlled on every level. Um, and so it, it really just gave me the independence that I needed. And um, I just finished my master's degree in 2019. And even though it had taken so much longer for me to catch up with my peers, I really do feel like um, that education is just a, one of the most you know, one of the things that I'm the most proud of in my life and being able to do that. Um, and everybody deserves to have an education. Every child deserves to have the same opportunities. It doesn't matter who you are. Congratulations. And people are saying Thank congratulations. You. And it's as if that families know to deprive, a, deprive us of our education as a tool to disempower us. It's another layer of control, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, your marriage was totally legal in California. That's correct. Is, is that still the case now? Unfortunately, it is still the case. Children at any age can get married in the state of California with judicial review and parental consent. And you did hear that right, right here in California. Any child can get married and it's despicable. So tell us how can the public support your cause to end child marriage in California? Well, there are several ways, and um, again, going to Unchained at last and finding out where they are in their, in their um, fight to end child marriage throughout the United States. But California is an extremely tough state. There's a coalition here. Um, if everybody wants to visit Global Hope 365, there's a letter writing campaign that we have going on um, targeting policymakers and legislators here in California. Um, they can sign my petition. Um, but I think really the biggest thing that people can do is educate themselves about this issue where they are locally and finding out who are the policymakers in your area and, and how do you stop this kind of abuse from occurring. Um, and just really going out there and finding the information, finding out what the laws are in your area, because this is a deep patriarchal system that is rooted in our society that we have to unroot and stop today as, as we're speaking. And it is one thing that we really can stop. We can stop with legislation. We can stop with these talks and having conversations as, as a society. 
And I really do believe that this is an area that, that will help empower so many young girls and, and even boys um, escape these extremely dangerous and abusive situations. Thank you, Sarah. And you know, the point that you made, as, as many have today, you were robbed of a childhood. And you know, you'd hope that as a child, you'd have more laws to protect you. When actually, when you're forced into these child marriages, you are deprived of rights because actually, the perpetrator appears to have more rights in that space. And that's something clearly that we've got from your story. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. And people and, and the Global Hope 365, all that information will be put up. So will your contact details. Um, if people have got any questions for Sarah when we go to Q&A, please just make a point of putting Sarah's name next to it. Um, and I am going to introduce the person who you referred to, Sarah, next, who is Freddy Rees, who is the founder of Unchained At Last. I've had the pleasure of working with Freddy in the past and still do. Um, according to Unchained At Last, between 2000 and 2010, nearly 250,000 minors were married in the US. Most were young girls married to adult men. Childhood marriage is still legal in states and Freddie has championed and campaigned the voice of many people. Freddie was 19 years old when her family arranged her marriage. And Freddie is going to share this journey, but also have a conversation, I hope, about the changes you want to see. So Freddie, over to you, please do share your story. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Jasvinder. And uh, just before I start, I just want to, you know, just say how much uh, admiration and respect and love I feel for all of the women who just spoke before me. Um, just such extraordinary women with such powerful stories who have turned their own trauma into a, a force for good. So, uh, so thank you all. And thank you, Devinder, for organizing this. So I want to share with you a story that has a, a sad beginning and it has an upsetting middle, but it does have a very hopeful ending. The story starts with a forced marriage, my forced marriage. I grew up in New York City, but I grew up in a very insular religious community in New York City where forced marriage is the norm under the guise of so-called arranged marriage. And I was 19, as Jesvinder said, when, I, uh, when my family married off to me off to a stranger with very little input from me. And, and to give you a sense of just how disempowered I was, I also underwent a physical examination to confirm my virginity when I was a bride. Uh, without any complaint, went along with it with a big smile on my face. And unfortunately, the stranger that I was married to turned out to be violent. But I, I figured out really quickly that I was just trapped. There was no way out for me. Within my marriage, within that uh, or the uh, Orthodox Jewish community, the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community where I grew up, I had, first of all, no reproductive rights. I was required to have sex with my husband and I was not allowed to use birth control. I had no financial rights. I was not allowed to have my own bank account, my own credit card, any of my own money. And I had limited legal rights under Orthodox Jewish law. A man is allowed to divorce his wife, but a woman does not have that right. I didn't have the, the legal right to end my own marriage. So really the only way out for me would have been if my family had agreed to take me back in. But my family refused. I was trapped in my marriage for 12 years. And when I finally managed to escape after 12 years with my two daughters, my family and community retaliated against me by shunning me. Uh, more than a decade later, they still consider me dead and, uh, and we have no contact. But I rebuilt my life and I founded Unchained at Last in 2011, which is the only organization in the United States that is dedicated to helping uh, women and girls to, and others to escape forced marriages. And I'm, just, I'm defining a forced marriage as one in which one or both parties do not give full free consent. And the perpetrators, like in my situation and like all, all the stories you've heard today, the perpetrators are almost always the parents and they use different uh, methods like force, fraud, or coercion to, uh, to, to force their, their children into marriage. So at Unchained at Last, we provide really comprehensive, crucial wraparound services, often life-saving services, everything from helping people to escape to getting them free legal representation. And uh, to date, even though we're a tiny team with a limited budget, we have been able to help more than 600, mostly women, and, uh, mostly women to escape 
from forced marriages, really diverse, every community and culture and, uh, you know, that you can think of, every religion, secular communities, and, uh, and not only women, but some also LGBTQ individuals whose parents use marriage as a form of conversion therapy. So it felt really good being able to, as I said before, take my trauma and use it as a, as a way to help other people turn it into a force for good. It was perhaps nothing as, as healing and empowering as that. But I warned you that the story has an upsetting middle, and here is where it comes. More and more girls under age 18 started calling us at Unchained at last to ask for the same help that we were providing to adults. And that's how I first came to realize in 2015 that the United States has a significant child marriage problem. And I'm defining a child marriage as one in which one or both parties is under the age of 18 at the time that the marriage takes place. At the time, marriage before 18 was legal in all 50 U.S. states, in all five district, in all five territories, the District of Columbia, and at the federal level. And at the time, more than half of the United States did not specify any minimum age for marriage, meaning that in more than half of the United States, the effective marriage age was zero. Uh, as Jez Binder said, our groundbreaking research, for a long time nobody had known how often this was happening, but our groundbreaking research showed that almost a quarter of a million children as young as 12 had married just in the decade 2000 to 2010. And almost all of them, by the way, were girls married to adult men. Now there are so many reasons that child marriage needs to end, but I'm gonna start with the main ones. The first one is that child marriage can so easily be forced. And you heard this again and again today, when a, a child before the age of 18 here in the United States does not have basic legal rights, something as basic as leaving home to escape an abusive spouse is, is difficult, if not impossible for a child before the age of 18, they simply don't have the right to open the front door and leave. They can't get into a domestic violence shelter because most domestic violence shelters won't take in uh, unaccompanied minors. They cannot easily retain attorneys because contracts with children typically are avoidable. Perhaps most shockingly, children typically are not allowed to bring a legal action in their own name, meaning a child can be entered into a marriage, disempowered throughout that process, as usually done by a parent and or a judge, and then they don't even have the right to file for divorce in most of the United States because they don't have the right to independently bring a legal action. And many of the girls who reach out to us when they realize how trapped they are and how limited the options are, unfortunately turn to self-harm and suicide attempts because that seems like the only way out for them. Now, another really important reason to end child marriage is that there are such devastating lifelong repercussions when a girl or a woman marries before 18, including right here in the United States, that in fact the U.S. State Department calls marriage before 18 a human rights abuse. It destroys girls' health, their education, their economic opportunities, significantly increases the risk that a girl or a woman will experience domestic violence, be physically assaulted within their marriage. Now, um, and in case, in case you're not fully convinced, one final reason I, I, I want to throw out there is also, and this is something you've also heard about today, child marriage also undermines statutory rape law. In most of the United States, what would otherwise be considered statutory rape would be considered a crime. In some cases, a felony rape becomes entirely legal within marriage because the laws specifically exempt those who first marry their victim. And in other states, marriage does, is not an exception under the statutory rape laws. It's still considered rape. And the shocking thing about that is in those states, when judges hand over a marriage license or a clerk hands over a marriage license, they're literally of sending these children, mostly girls, home to be raped. They know that these children are going to be raped. So when we at UNCHLS first realized this, we also realized there was a very simple solution to this. Most states already said 18 is the marriage age, but every state at the time was allowing exceptions, these dangerous gaping exceptions on loopholes under which children could marry. And so we said, all we have to do is raise awareness of this and convince legislators to pass legislation eliminating these dangerous loopholes. So I've written op-eds in the New York Times and the Washington Post and every paper that will have me, and I've given dozens of media interviews. And we invented a form of protest called the chain-in. People donate their bridal gowns to us to use at chain-ins. So we all wear bridal gowns and veils, and we chain our wrists and tape our mouths to show the world this is what life looks like for a girl or a woman who is forced to marry. And we organized email campaigns and formed coalitions and recruited allies. And we hope to introduce legislation uh, in uh, 
you know, across the United States, state by state, to eliminate the loopholes and set 18, keep 18 as the marriage age. And we were shocked that in state after state, legislators looked at this simple, really common sense legislation that harms no one, costs nothing, and ends a human rights abuse, and said, eh, no thank you, pass. And in state after state, legislators rejected or watered down this legislation. Uh, we were so frustrated at one point at Unchained the Last that we all promised that when the first U.S. state took this, the, the drastic step of ending child marriage, we would all get tattoos to commemorate the victory. And so I am very pleased to show you today my tattoo. It is a broken chain. And that, I got that in, uh, in 2018 because Delaware in 2018 became the first U.S. state to end child marriage, followed soon after by New Jersey, which is my home state. Uh, the American Samoa followed their lead also in 2018. This year in January, the U.S. Virgin Islands, we helped to end child marriage there. And just last month in May, during a global pandemic, somehow we managed to get legislation passed in Pennsylvania and Minnesota. And we now have a growing national movement with legislation pending in other states as well. So I promised you a hopeful ending, and here it is. We are now four down, only 46 to go in the push to end child marriage in the United States. And then we're coming back for the forced marriage of adults as well. And uh, we on the Unchained team promise to keep pushing and protesting and making noise until no girl is ever again a bride and every adult is free to choose whether, when, and whom to marry and whether to get divorced. So thank you all for being a part of this discussion and helping to make that happen. Thank you, Freddie, and thank you for everything you've done and how, like many here, you've turned your experiences of trauma into empowerment, not just for yourself, but for others also. What I'd like to understand, Freddie, is, you know, you say it's common sense, you know, here it is, they're watering it down. What, what, what are their reasons for not wanting to take on changes in the loopholes or the law? What kind of things are they actually saying to you in terms of those challenges? You know, you would not even believe some of the, the excuses that legislators have used. We like to call them vomitocious excuses in many cases. And we have a hashtag on, on uh, often on Twitter, we'll, we'll post on Wednesdays, we call it vomitocious Wednesdays. And we post some of the vomitocious excuses that legislators have used. And, uh, you know, and Sarah and Dawn have both joined me, you know, talking to legislators and they have heard some uh, firsthand some of these vomitocious excuses. Probably the most common one is, well, let's say a girl is pregnant. And, you know, legislators are not embarrassed to say, I'm an old fashioned kind of guy. The girl gets pregnant. I think she just has to get married. Completely ignoring the fact that A, studies show that as harmful as marriage is for any child is particularly harmful for a pregnant teenage girl. Uh, it is, you know, really conclusively the all the available data shows that a pregnant teenage girl who marries is more likely to suffer economic deprivation and instability. No legislator is doing her a favor by marrying her off. It also ignores the really horrific fact that, that pregnancy exceptions to the marriage age have been used to cover up rape and to force girls to marry their rapists. And uh, you, you heard, um, you know, both Dawn and Sarah tell their story of this exact thing happening in the United States to them. And sure. unfortunately, that, that keeps on happening. But legislators, unfortunately, most of them are men and they're just not embarrassed to cling to their sexism. So Freddie, tell the audience and tell us all, how can we help you get those 46 to go on board? What, what, what is it we can do? proactively, what is tangible for us to do to help you? Well, thank you for that question. And the answer is there are so many ways from, from simple little things you can do at home right now to you know, bigger things that you can do. And I urge everybody to go to unchained.last.org to find out, first of all, what's the situation in your state if you live in the United States and, uh, and find out these simple specific things, everything from following us on social media and sharing and liking and retweeting so that we can make some noise about this, to joining us at our chain ends, to uh, you know, applying to be a volunteer or an intern or applying for an open job position. There are a lot of different ways, but really it takes a village to end force and child marriage. So please everybody join the village. I, 
you know, you're here today, so that means you care about this stuff. And they don't have to be in New York to join. They can be all over the world. Please, everywhere. I mean, we are trying to pass legislation right now in New York. So if you happen to be in New York, we really need you to step up. But no, we have uh, 46 states to go. So wherever you are in the United States, around the world, you can help. Please do. So, Freddie, just, just one other thing, and I want to bring you back to your experience, if I may, because I know there are survivors listening and we're getting lots of messages. People are thanking you all for sharing in the way you are. But one of the things is, and we share a common experience in where a family has declared you dead in their eyes. And clearly you are a, a power of strength with your children. And it's, what did, what did that feel like? And how do you actually overcome that? Because people are in that space today or possibly facing that. What, what message can you give to these individuals who may be facing that or are in that space? Yeah, you know, that's a, it's a, when we're talking about harmful practices, there are so many different ones. Some of the ones that we talked about here today and some of the ones we just touched on and shunning is a significant form of honor violence that we need to recognize for what it is. It's a form of honor violence. And I, I you know, from my experience, I, I try to explain to people what it's like when everybody they know and love suddenly cuts off all contact with them and tells them that they're dead. And it's, no, I'm, I'm not dead. And, you know, for me, it was ironic because it also happened at the moment when, when I started to feel alive. So uh, for those of us who are very much alive and our family has declared us dead, um, all I can say is, you know, I, I live every day to prove to myself that I am alive and to prove to my family, whether they are paying attention or not, how wrong they are. And, um, but, you know, if, if there's any way, like with any other harmful practice, if there's any way for us survivors to take our own trauma and turn it into a way to help others, you know, what more can we ask for? So, uh, so again, just, just even more reason to push back against these harmful practices, forced marriage, child marriage, any form of honor violence, including shunning, uh, FGM, virginity exams, all of these, you know, we're here today to say, let's, let's put a stop to all of it. And there is this power, isn't there, in knowing you're not the only one and then you can, we're all together in this, you know. And the really important thing is that our children will not inherit that legacy of abuse because of the choices that we have made in this space. Thank you, Freddie. Um, and thank you to all of you again. And the messages are coming through thick and fast in the chat. People giving you huge positivity and love, everyone. And uh, thanking you deeply. So I want to keep on reiterating that to you all. So now it's time for the audience to put forward their questions. And I am going to go into the chat right now. And uh, I think, Melody, are you going to give me some questions to pose to the group at this point? People can just bear with me. Right. Okay, we have one here. Um, uh, this, this individual is asking, um, and this is for all of you really to come in, if any of the speakers have accessed mental health services, what professional services insights could you give? I guess what he's saying here is, um, or she, I'm not sure, I wonder how equipped mental health professionals are to understand the traumatic difficulties in the context of culture, religion, and your experiences. As somebody who works in the NHS mental health, would really like to hear something from yourselves in terms of how they can improve things. Please, anyone would like to come in on that? I would like to share my own experience, if that's okay. Please, Daisy. Um, so throughout um, the last 14, 15 years of my life, since I have left my child marriage and dealt with my uh, traumatic honor based abuse experiences, I tried various times to get um, therapy and to get support. And I found time after time, it was such a struggle to speak to somebody who would understand where I was coming from. Um, I'm not exaggerating if I said that I've tried 
different therapists over 10 15 therapists until only last year in december i finally found somebody who was able to be um who was able to look at my story from a cultural perspective and would not give me uh, very generic answers. I often had, when I was speaking to therapists, people would say to me, you know, I would say, for example, in my case, my father is serving a life sentence for my sister's murder. And I would talk about, you know, that traumatic relationship, that, that experience and being let down as a child. And I would often get suggestions like, well, you should go and speak to your father. You should try to mend that relationship. And there was just no sense of, uh, you know, cultural scope of what I was dealing with and the, the issues that, the complex issues that were actually at hand. So I do believe the help is out there. Speaking to a therapist who understands these issues and who is able to offer you guidance and support. Um, but I feel like it's not accessible as it should be. It's not as accessible. Uh, the same way in a lot of the um, uh, systems like, uh, you know, healthcare, there, there is a, a lack of understanding on these issues. And I believe training and education is the way forward. And in my experience, it's taken me 14 years to finally speak to somebody where I've not felt like they don't understand me. They don't understand what I'm going through. Thank you, Paisley. And in that those fourteen years, you almost—is it fair to say you can feel re-traumatized sometimes in that space? Yes, absolutely. Because you you start to ask yourself, you know, maybe it's me. Maybe I am causing an issue out of nothing because the advice that you're giving is so generalized and it doesn't cater to all these multi complex issues that you're dealing with you know you've got to deal with the fact that you've been abandoned your family don't want anything to do with you you've experienced maybe sexual abuse domestic abuse and this general advice that you're given makes you question your own trauma and whether did this actually happen to me maybe it's me and you start to inflict the the blame on yourself and you start to question are my perpetrators really the ones who are guilty and it's, you know, it's a very toxic cycle and it makes your healing process even harder and it takes even longer. Thank you, Paisley. I do have a couple of things to say. Please come in. Thank you. Um, for me, I think, you know, even at um, around 15 and 16 years old, I knew that I needed help. I didn't know what that looked like, but I knew that I was going to need some help and I was able to find some resources as a teenager, um, it was like different um, social services, you know, mental health so services. Um, but the thing that I found myself fighting the most um, was acknowledging my truth and honoring my story and dismantling the false narrative and the brainwashing that had gone on for years and decades. I mean, even into your adult life, you're still fighting the, the lies and the false narratives of the trusted adults in your life. And when you're that impressionable as a child, it's really difficult to find your truth and hold on to your truth and heal and recover. And for me, counseling, is, I consider it to be just life maintenance even now. And I will probably always have a therapist just to check in, you know, check in with regularly and and be true to myself and my story. But you do definitely get re-traumatized um, if you get those just generic feedback from a therapist. So Thank one you. question, how, uh, following on from that Dawn, if I may, um, how do you, what kind of strategies do you have to deal with triggers? Let's see, oh goodness, um, I think for oh. me, <laughs> recognizing um, the things that trigger you um, and fact checking it, you know, is it true? Is it real? Um, what are my feelings about it? What do I believe? Um, and so with triggers, um, it, for me personally, I think um, going back to myself and my wife's wise voice, um, fact checking. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, why I think I think so. So checking in with yourself because it feels as if you're constantly you've been on a journey of trying to understand what happened, and then correct 
checking in with the reality and the denials because these were meant to be trusted people in your life. Right. Um, we've had somebody who's just posted who's a survivor that 20 years later she's still struggling to find mental health support for PTSD but hearing from you Dawn and Paisy it's really helped to understand how you relate to the difficulties that's helped. Um, a question open for you all how do you deal with the lack of closure when your family and community oust you? Um, hi, can I uh, respond to that? Sure. I actually found that the um, the distance from my family actually helped. And um, it, it was one of the things that gave me um, the ability to step back and find out who I was. What, who, what did I want? You know, um, who was I? Uh, because even though my, my marriage had only lasted seven years, it was during the formative years of my life. Um, and this, is, this ties back into the mental health. Um, but when you're a teenager, your brain is forming at a rapid pace. And unfortunately, when adults and abusers get into your brain, that does affect you long term. So actually having that space from my abusers who were many of my family members um, and that toxicity actually gave me some space to um, to identify the abuse and um, also you know, seek out the support in, in people in my community um, and other friends and in the family members that still wanted to be there and support me, so. Thank you, Sarah. That's really helpful. Um, there's a question here in relation to how, how do families use religion as a tool to oppress? Freddie, I'm looking at you because in your conversation, you talked about religion and you talked about how that was used. Would you mind coming in? Uh, sure, you know, I can, I can speak for my own experience. So, you know, I, I, you know I, I feel uncomfortable answering for other people's experiences and other religions. But certainly in uh, where, where I grew up, everything was justified by this is what God wants. And every single abuse that I was subjected to was done in the name of God. And, uh, and it, you know, and I want to make clear also when I talk about the ultra Orthodox Jewish community, it's very different and separate from the rest of the Jewish community. It's a very extreme uh, form, a very fundamentalist version of Judaism that's very, very different from reform, conservative, even modern Orthodox Judaism. But, uh, but certainly I, I talked about some of the, of the practices and, and the customs. And I, I wouldn't even say law, it's, not, it's less laws because it's really interpretation. It's, you know, this is how they interpreted it. And, um, and it was just an extreme form of, of sexism. It was all about maintaining patriarchy and very prescribed gender roles. And, uh, and, and everything became, it became, this is what God wants, this is what God needs. And because of that, you, it, as a woman, had almost nothing. I mean, growing up in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, and then even growing up as an adult too, in the prayer book, men make, make a blessing every morning. It was really written in my prayer book, thanking God for not making them a non-Jew, a slave, or a woman. And think about what a message that sends to girls growing up in the, in that community, and then everything else from there. How 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 is it okay to have a set of laws where a man can divorce his wife, but a woman can't divorce her husband? How how does that how how is that okay? And I you know I can speak about this now because I have completely left the ultra orthodox Jewish community, and I'm. Um, so, so separated from it now, um, but, but really my heart goes out to the, the sisters and the friends that I left behind who are still in that community. And for those of you who have watched uh, Unorthodox on Netflix or read the memoir Unorthodox, you, you have some idea of what I'm talking about. Would anybody else like to come in on that in terms of religion and how families can use that to brainwash? Actually, I'm going to say that. I'm going to use that. Um, um, yeah, Joe Spinder, I would love to comment on Please. that just because um, religion was such a huge part of 
of the reason why I was um, why I was forced into marriage, but not just forced into marriage. It was used throughout my life to to brainwash me um, to say that I was less than that my role was a, a specific role that I never wanted. I and it it got to the point in in my even in my youth, I was like, I don't want to be a girl because I just felt like I couldn't do anything. I, I couldn't go swimming. I wanted to run in track. I wasn't allowed to wear sh like shorts, so then I couldn't run in track. There were so many things that my brothers got to do that I didn't get to do, and I was like angry at myself for being a woman. And that was how deep um, that the religion was used on me. And it, you know, religion was used to cover up forms of abuse throughout my life, not just to me, to my my brothers and sisters, um, to the whole community, and it and. You know, I, it, it was, uh, it became very conflicting for me much later on. And, um, and, and now um, as an adult, I'm just very confused about what religion even means. So that's my yeah. sense. <laughs> That, yeah, it does make sense, Ari. It's part of that journey again, isn't it, of the, the half-truths, the untruths, the lies you've been told and you're, you're unpicking them and finding out, fact-checking for yourself what is the reality. It's almost as if our identities are taken from us completely and then when we become free, we are rebuilding our identities with the truths. There's a question here uh, for everybody. Um, what could be the best way forward in educating parents I'm open to suggestions. It's so difficult to engage parents and the older generation. Any thoughts, anybody? I will. So, um, I, you know, educating parents, yes, you know, that, that would be a great step forward. Um, my personal position about child marriage is, I, I'm not sure what this question is, or we, we, we need to educate parents about education and, and had the devastating consequences of it? Or do we just say, why are we educating parents on why they shouldn't marry their children? Why don't we just move forward and make sure that parents cannot make that choice to marry off their children? I mean, we're trusting adults to make, you know, great decisions for their children. But the data is proving that we cannot trust adults and that we need to set a minimum age of 18. You could not trust my parents to make a good choice for me. Yeah, um, I hear you, Dawn, and I have to say, I mean, I've been disowned for 47 years now. I have three children, two, two grandchildren, one on the way, and on my mother's side, there's no family, and there's no way you could educate even my British-born sisters, um, you know, but let's educate them about the law, about child protection and etc. But that, that's my view, which is why I campaign so hard to criminalise forced marriage in the UK. Does anybody else have a view? Um, I would just like to say, yeah, it's, I think it's just going to be so difficult to educate parents now that what is really needed is just, there just has to be legislation such as like what's happened in the UK uh, with making forced marriage criminalized i think it has to happen here and what Freddy's doing here with unchained at last like just passing legislation where it's signed off and child marriage just has been stopped in four states where the child marriage age is raised to 18 because once parents see that this is happening they have to pay attention they have to pay, to pay attention to the laws they might not listen to anybody talking about this, but they have to pay attention to laws. So that's the only way forward is to introduce this legislation, make laws, and then the parents will, you know, hopefully pay attention because they have to abide by the law. So that's the only thing that can be done now, I believe. Do, do you think that education that we're talking about really sits with the younger generation today? Yes, I mean, we have like more chance with the younger, uh, younger generation, but I think with the um, older people, like our parents, um, it's just laws that they're going to have to respect. So, so laws are the only way forward. I have a question here for all of you again. How have some of the survivors coped with being disowned, especially when there are special celebrations like Eid, Diwali, New Year, their children's birthdays, births, Mother's Day, Father's Day? This is speaking to the heart here, people. It's, it's tough. Um, <laughs> Let me see. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, you know, it's, it's really tough because you constantly are reminded that you are blamed for what has happened. And as a result of you being blamed, you can't experience the simple things, like you said, celebrating with your family. And, you know, you surround yourself with friends and strong communities. But I often, for me, I often feel such a sense of loneliness and emptiness. The, my, my family, my blood family, these are the people that I grew up with. These are the people that, you know, I have childhood memories with. Um, they're not all great memories, but at the same time, you just feel you see families and you see people celebrating and you just feel, why can't my family accept me? What did I do wrong? I didn't do anything wrong. I simply, you know, called out what they did wrong. So uh, for me, it gets really lonely uh, because as well, my relationship with my family, I haven't been disowned, but a lot of it is on their basis and when they're comfortable and how they're comfortable with me being in their family setting. So, um, it takes a great deal. And I think it, for me, it's probably time that it will take a bit longer to actually, um, you know, be at peace with the fact that I haven't done anything wrong. And if they don't want to be a part of my life and have me in those um, celebrating events, then it's fine. But it's definitely lonely and it's, it's hard. It's, it's a really hard thing to live with. Thank you, Paisy. Does anybody else want to come in? I will. Thank you. Okay, um, Something that I noticed um, in raising my family without family is, you know, it is just to reiterate how lonesome it is. It's very lonely. And that my heart hurts the most, though, for my children that were raised in such a way where, you know, their friends and classmates, schoolmates were talking about, you know, the grandparents or spending time with the grandparents or going on holiday with the grandparents. And when you're recovering from the child marriage your children just don't have that so that the whole idea of what family looks like is completely different and i believe we you just don't recover from it my children my children from that marriage are in their early 30s and you know they still don't have that kind of relationship with some of our family members that you normally would and so we're just um, ostracized and outcast and and so my children are suffering the ripple effect of the shaming that my parents and my family had done to me and and I do want to say really quickly that I do have some aunties and some cousins um, that are very supportive and loving um, so we're lucky and thankful to have that thank you so sure. see when I when I think really deeply about this question I I take myself back to um, owning the fact that the fact that my children have unconditional love and regard from me from the friends that have become family actually and the fact that they have freedom independence rights all those things for me that always trumps the pain when i think about the loss of family that, that's that's the way i bring myself back to that place if that helps um now I we only have five more minutes, ten more minutes actually. What what I would like to do is I'd like to give each one of you the opportunity just to speak to the audience directly in terms of reminding them of your contact details, how they can support you. Um, what is it you really want to see changed here? So if you could briefly, in about one or two minutes please share what is it what 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 is your ask from them and where can they go and find out about that ask so i'm going to start with you dawn if you're on my screen if i may over to you um well my call to action is um to educate i believe that educating our community is the first step to ending child marriage here in the states and abroad um so i believe sharing um, the different, you know, uh, videos or statistics or stories on um, any social media platform is help getting, the, that's how we get the word out there right now. And not being afraid to talk about it. I've certainly, you know, by going public with my story, I'm giving permission for others to share my story as well. My story is now our story. And I want, I want that to, to change legislation. Um, so I think just educating um, and not being afraid to talk about it. Thank you. 
Thank you. I like my story is now our story. Thank you for sharing your story. So, Freddy, to you, please. Yeah, well, you know, there are, there are problems out there that we can talk about that have no easy solution that we all agree they're terrible, but we don't know what to do about them. Child marriage is not one of them. Child marriage has a solution. Not only can we achieve the, this in our lifetime, we can do it this week. All we have to do is get the legislation passed in another 46 states. So this is, this is a problem that we can all, if we, get, if we join together, we can actually solve this problem and we can do it right now. So um, thank you for, for, so, for caring and for wanting to join us. So Freddie, remind us of where they can find you and your organization Unchained at Last. It's unchainedatlast.org, and that's where you have specific actions that you can take. And, uh, and uh, among that is, is just following us on social media. So we're at Unchained at Last on pretty much every platform you can think of. So find us, like us, share us, tweet and, us. And, and Freddie, if people are listening and they are themselves survivors and want to share their story, is that where they go? Yes, so on the website, if you want to share your own story, there's a way to do that. If you need help or you know somebody who needs help escaping a forced marriage, you can do that on there as well. And there are specific actions. You can look up the status in your state, first of all, if you're in the United States, and you can also take specific actions. There are pre-written emails that you can submit. It will tell you about, unfortunately, because of COVID, we have no upcoming events or chain-ins right, planned right now, but soon we will join our email list also and that way you'll find out when we're when we're out of our fuzzy socks and out of the house again but for right now our hashtag is lockdown rise up we're not letting the pandemic stop us we are still uh, fighting for some child marriage just in our fuzzy socks now absolutely hence we're here you can only see the top part of me sorry <laughs> what's about what's about you what is it you want to say to the world um well what i would like to say is is really educate yourself about this issue in your local area. I think as, as activists and as people who want to make change, anybody can be an activist. You can be an armchair activist uh, from, your, from your home office these days. Um, all you have to do is find out what is happening in your local area, what are the laws, and how can you change them? Um, you know, the statistics are alarming. 650 million women alive today were married under the age of 18. So I guarantee you, in your area, there is some law or some policy that needs to be changed to address this. And also, like, go back to your families and challenge these patriarchal views and, um, you know, outdated um, ideas of, of pregnancy and childbirth and marriage. Like, we are in 2020 people, it's time to wake up. We, you know, we are capable of, of having children. We are capable of being mothers, of having careers, and um, we should have access to education just as much as anybody else does. So, you know, if, if your activism looks like getting involved in your local school district um, and helping children and, and foster their, their past and, and their ideas and wanting to get educated, that's a way to get involved. If it's, it's, if it's mentoring a young child and, and letting them know, hey, you can follow any path that you want to. If I had had one person in my life tell me, you can do anything you want to do. All you have to do is go for it. That could have changed my life. So I'm, I'm just saying we all have a duty to our children to honor and foster them and uh, make sure that they make it in life. Everybody deserves access to the same uh, rights and opportunities in this life. Thank you, Sarah. And that's really poignant if, you know, one person has said something to you. It could be a teacher, a neighbor, a friend. So that, you know, third party reporting, people being their eyes and ears and not ignoring what they see or feeling that they might be prying. If it's a child, you know, and it, look, it looks wrong, well, it probably is going to be wrong. Question it. So Devinda, over to you, please. Yes, um, so I, I would say, yeah, we have to open our hearts and our minds. I mean, no child should be going through this. I mean, children have the right to enjoy their life. They shouldn't be just domesticated, you know, trained to serve a future husband. Um, 
education has to happen. So many girls are deprived of education because their parents focus on them getting married first. And that has to stop. So, um, you know, for instance, like my background, being Punjabi, there's, or even just generally being Indian, there's like a large majority who focus on education for their girls. But there's also a large Punjabi population, like especially where I'm from, from Bradford, where the parents are so strict and they focus mostly just on kid, on their girls getting married first and they don't care about their education as what happened to me happened to all my friends in Bradford. We were all going through this at the same time when we were 14 years old, all being shown pictures of boys that we had to get married and this is very wrong. So I feel like, yes, like what I said earlier, this education to parents is not going to like help what has to happen is laws have to change. And so, yeah, we have to get behind the organizations such as CAM and Nirvana in the UK, such as Unchained at Last here in America, find our local, like uh, who, who can help in our state. So for instance, here in California, we've got Global Hope 365. So I encourage you all to go to their website. Uh, you'll be able to find them if you do that search and then um, this presentation is going to be shared later on and you'll have access to the links. So go to Global Health 365. Um, they help, they're going to help, like that's a California coalition to end child marriage here in California, which of course, since I live here in California now, that's where my interests are in stopping child marriage here in California. Um, I have my petition. I would strongly encourage people to go sign my petition, sign Sarah's petition, because she's also from here in California. Um, we have to help Global 365, because I think they can get it done, working alongside Unchained at last. So if we all go and join like the digital letter writing campaign, that can only help our cause here in California. And so I strongly encourage all of you, in whichever state you are, to you know, just join. Join us by to end child marriage. Thank you. Thank you. So I can see schools have a really key role in this, and I echo what you're saying because in the UK we know there's been concerns around hundreds of missing children presumed at risk of forced marriage, child marriage, and nobody's asking questions, and that's happening year on year. And the summer holidays are around the corner. So schools are key and education is key. Um, somebody's just posted, I also think, just like the hashtag Me Too movement, create a safe space for, for people to speak out, we need to create that safe space to empower survivors to speak out. Um, that I just wanted to share that with you. So Paisley, could you come in please? Um, you are our last but not least person. Thank you, Jacinda. Um, I would urge anybody who is watching this to please continue the conversation. Please don't log off and forget about this conversation tonight. Speak to your friends about it, speak to your family about it, read up about this, because this is a huge issue. A lot of the time I find when I'm speaking to people, they're shocked that this is happening in this country or in America. They can't believe it. I've met so many people who say to me, gosh, I've never thought of that. Is it really a big problem? And we're talking about millions. We're talking about one of the most vulnerable groups in our society is children. We owe it to them to protect them. And I think we can all agree that we've all been let down as children. We can't let this keep happening. So please, it involves you just look up on our petitions, look up on our social medias and help where you can. Uh, for me, all of my social media is Paisy Malika and on there you can find my petition um, and you can please support it. We have an amazing support at the moment. We have cross-party support from the government, but we need the public to say enough is enough and we can do it. We've seen things change. We've seen legislations change. We can do it. We just need each and every single one of you. If just you send this to one person and they send it to the next person we're creating a chain of change and that's what we need so please please continue that conversation and we thank you thank you paisy so now i'm just going to thank you all you know um we've heard very honestly from the heart your stories in terms of robbed childhoods rape kidnapped deprived of education reach reprodu reproductive rights health self-harming suicide but you have turned that trauma into a space where you are selflessly sharing your experiences to further the advancement of gender equality and to challenge and tackle child marriage it's a credit to you all and i 
I feel incredibly moved by speaking to you all and this is being recorded so people could use this for education too so again Devinda is giving you information you can go to that website and we are sisters internationally and I mean Paisley sit in the UK but internationally we work collectively I do want to also just say for those who may be affected by what they've heard or they want to share their stories Brady has given the information for Enchained at Last. May I share the Carmen Nirvana website, please? And also the Carmen Nirvana helpline, which is 0800 5999 247. And, you know, Freddy, it's the same for you. It's confidential. You know, you're listening to people who will understand in that space. So for me now, um, people on there are all saying, please tell them all we salute them. We honour you all. We like that word honour, don't we? Because we have honour and we honour how we feel and who we are. And um, the person who tried to interrupt it has actually helped to empower us even further. You know, this is a, more of a testimony to us why we have to speak. So thank you all for joining us and thank you to the audience out there. You have the contact details for all the speakers here. So please, they've given you their permissions, get in touch, tweet. So thank you. Thank you. It is. It's just us now. I'd like to thank Melody and Fatima for helping. Yes, of course. Thank you, Melody and Fatima, for we couldn't have done this without you. Um, so Melody and Fatima, thank you for supporting this as volunteers. Volunteers are the backbone, as we know, activists of what we do. Thank you so much for, for allowing us to, to be in this space. Um, true honor, no matter, matter words. Thank you. Thank you, lady. Thank you very much. It was a complete honor to be here with you, to join you in your struggles, you know, to put out that word. I, I listened to every single one of your stories and my heart goes out to you and I will definitely support in any way that I can. Um, to continue to spread the power, to continue to spread your struggle, and to empower each and every single one of you. So thank you so much for sharing that and for being such brave warriors, the women that you guys are, and for being a great example to not just the children, but to the women and the growing women of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. I think we should all stay connected. We need to have a a, a survivors movement on zoom of some kind <laughs> okay thank you again everybody